The Friends of Farm Foundation program can help you further expand your network with a diverse group of food and agriculture leaders. Entry-level benefits include virtual networking sessions, while contributions at the upper levels unlock additional benefits, such as a personalized tour of our new innovation and education campus. Help us celebrate 90 years of making a positive impact on the future of agriculture. Visit farmfoundation.org to explore the benefits of becoming a friend and supporter of Farm Foundation today. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our Farm Foundation Forum, Seeds of Change, Exploring AI Solutions for Agriculture Today and Tomorrow. We are glad to have the opportunity to engage with you and are thankful to Farm Credit for their support of this forum. My name is Martha King, and I am the Vice President of Programs and Projects at Farm Foundation, located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. I'm looking forward to today's discussion, which will look at the frontiers of artificial intelligence in agriculture. Before we get into today's program, I'm going to take just a few moments to share a bit more about Farm Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit working at the intersection of agriculture and society to address challenges that affect the entire food and ag value chain. Specifically, we are an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, accelerating people and ideas into action. The three levers we use to accomplish this are policy, innovation, and education. Forums such as today's are just one part of our extensive program of work, which is guided by our mission to build trust and understanding at the intersection of agriculture and society, and our vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. We rely on partnerships to fund our work and increase our impact. So if you're interested in learning more about funding or partnering with us, I invite you to reach out to explore collaboration. Now I'd like to take a minute to highlight our Friends of Farm Foundation program. With your enrollment as a friend, you will not only be helping to support the mission and vision of Farm Foundation, but you will also gain exclusive benefits such as first reads of our issue reports, networking opportunities, and much more. Being a friend is an investment in building a better future for farmers, our communities, and our world. To learn more about being a friend of Farm Foundation, go to farmfoundation.org slash friends. The link is also being posted in the chat. In addition to learning more about Farm Foundation and our work by visiting our website, I encourage you to connect with us on our social media platforms. If you are posting on social media about this afternoon's session, we ask that you please use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. And now a few final housekeeping notes. There will be an audience question and answer session at the end. We'll be using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and not the chat to queue questions. You can enter those questions at any time throughout the forum. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on our website at farmfoundation.org as well as on our YouTube channel. We'll send out that link following today's program. When the forum concludes, you will receive a link to a brief survey. We appreciate your feedback and your time in completing that survey. Now let's turn to today's forum topic, artificial intelligence in agriculture. Today's outstanding panel of industry leaders will discuss how AI is reshaping the landscape of agriculture from precision farming and crop management to sustainable practices and increased productivity. It's now my pleasure to introduce as our moderator and discussion leader, Dr. Dennis Buckmaster. Uh, Dr. Buckmaster is a professor in agricultural and biological engineering at Purdue University. He previously served as assistant dean and associate director of academic programs in the Purdue College of Agriculture. In 2017, he became a dean's fellow for digital agriculture. His research focuses on forage and biomass systems with particular focus on harvest technologies as they affect storage, transportation, and subsequent utilization. New research is an ongoing in, as ongoing in applications of mobile computing and computational technologies, specifically for agriculture, with a focus on data management for improved decision making. We're so pleased to have you as our moderator today, Dennis. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. Uh, I saw some of the deck that uh, our panelists will be showing today. I'm just very excited to moderate with you. Next. So I have just a few uh, real quick introductory comments to share, <clears throat> a few visuals. This one, I thought for a little bit of humor's sake, I would ask ChatGPT, tell me about AI. And so I'm just showing you, and I won't talk through all of this, but I'm just showing you some of the content that AI uh, thought it knew about AI. So artificial intelligence on artificial intelligence. Uh, but I did want to point out the visual on the right there about the different levels of uh, the ability of a machine to imitate human intelligence compared to an algorithm that can incorporate intelligence by automatically learning, and then sort of the deep learning uh, level, and we have different words for all of these, but algorithms that actually mimic the human brain to incorporate intelligence into machines as we go. Next. 
Uh, so I posed the additional question, how does AI to apply to agriculture? And this was chat GPT's uh, top eight or nine or 10 list here. Uh, so if you look at these, and actually in the deck that uh, our panelists are going to present today, you're going to see some very good examples of almost each one of these from precision ag to market analysis, soil health, climate resilience, some livestock monitoring, sort of <clears throat> all across the um, uh, the gamut here. Next. So I did pose uh, the question also to chat GPT, uh, because it seems like most of the artificial intelligence applied to agriculture has been in the role of image processing. Like at the right, you'll see a little bit of poultry behavior, livestock movements, and their lameness detection or hand washing um, uh, success in hand washing. So most of the applications of AI seem to be visual, uh, visual analysis, either image or video processing. But I asked, well, what other areas? And you will see some of those today and they're, they're listed there. So there is artificial intelligence beyond image analysis as very applicable <clears throat> across the whole ag value chain. Next. So I put the categories of artificial intelligence and ag really in two buckets. They're pretty simple buckets. One is the it's simply the AI for doing things we could do as humans, but to do it faster, more accurately, maybe more consistently, maybe without getting tired, et cetera. So um, there's a whole host of things that artificial intelligence can do to as an augmenter or a complementer to the things we do as humans. Perhaps the more powerful one is the category <clears throat> of AI to do things that we as humans actually cannot do. We are very smart, but we are limited in our ability to manage uh, cognitive load and integrate many things. And so artificial intelligence might allow us to leverage knowledge across disciplines, businesses, individuals, to analyze, analyze complex systems for interactions, that our human brains honestly just can't quite grasp. And then of course, there's AI for automation and we'll see plenty of that today as well. So I did want to show there in that image on the right, this is a, a graphic of the way that we're handling some of the data at the Purdue Research Farms using NATS as a message passing service, but uh, to integrate data across the, the farm is certainly a challenge that we will, will be addressing today. Next. So uh, some sort of very specific examples, uh, and you'll hear more, uh, image or video processing to detect diseases and uh, nutrient deficiencies. You see here some very detailed scans. So this is not, not remote sensing, it's very proximal, proximal sensing on the leaf, even looking at the geometry of the leaf and the scans that we get. On the right, this is a, a use of the segment anything model, SAM. Uh, to improve our ability to autonomously navigate um, amongst cornrows. Next. Um, <clears throat> there are several working around the country and around the world uh, using the notion of large language models that are in a more customized way, where we don't just use all the information that's known to man on, or seemingly known to man on the internet, but we would use uh, walled knowledge bases. So, uh, essentially knowledge that we trust and we would only query that. So you'll see an example, a couple of examples of that later in this session. Uh, and this is just uh, one way of using, leveraging large language models specifically for agriculture. Next. Certainly those of us that are in production ag and even processing and uh, logistics, often we're really only interested in where are the anomalies? Like if things are normal, I will just sleep well tonight and be happy. But what we want to know is where are things not normal or uh, just a little bit, uh, you know, away from what we would expect as a good production uh, state of uh, of growth or that sort of thing. So the ability to identify anomalies with machine learning, with statistics, with monitoring, uh, certainly is a good application of in AI in ag. We might not completely automate everything that follows after, but we can at least uh, facilitate the human interaction with the actual productive production system. Next. 
Uh, of course, all of the AI relies on a tremendous amount of data. And so even in precision ag, we have uh, not always big, often it is actually big, but usually it's complex data, data from an assortment of sources, some remote sensing, sensors, machine data, things that only a human knows, and we need to actually integrate that so we can make sense of it. AI uh, stands to be a very good tool or a, a assortment of tools that could allow us to integrate those assorted uh, data streams. Next. Uh, this is one of my favorite images that sort of indicates that the notion of a digital twin uh, where there's the real world in which we live. And that's the one that we actually drive tractors and turn on irrigation systems and fly drones and, and grow crops. But there also is the virtual system uh, that is our best we can do representation of the actual physical world that we live in and, and grow things and uh, consume things. The advantage of having a virtual system or this digital twin is we'll be able to construct experiments, conduct experiments, where we can try different things. And then based on what we learn in that modeling effort, then execute what seems to be the best plan, whether that plan is regarding planting, irrigation, timing of marketing, uh, rerouting for logistical reasons, et cetera. Uh, AI serves as, a, a, again, a powerful tool to facilitate our decision-making on short and long-term uh, range of decisions. Next. So one thing that I'm personally excited about is this whole notion of biophysical models. Like we used to just call it simulation. Uh, now it has a uh, lot of branches, <clears throat> some of them uh, not necessarily biophysical. They could be biochemical, bio phenomic, et cetera, where we would use artificial intelligence and simply the set of equations that we have and parameters that we have learned from over many, many years of research in agriculture, but we could leverage it with AI to either parameterize those models, maybe set the initial conditions so that they'll work a little bit better, that sort of thing. So the image there on the right is uh, some AI assisted forest inventory simply based on imagery and a host of algorithms built to analyze such imagery, we actually inventory the, the uh, hardwood and the softwood uh, that's in a forest, essentially trying to digitize every single tree on the planet. Next. Uh, and of course, uh, data science has been a big thing in recent years, this whole notion of uh, getting data, wrangling it, cleaning it, visualizing it, doing statistics and making insight based upon it. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, data science will go away uh, because there we have to code that sort of thing. But I do think artificial intelligence is gonna facilitate many of the data things that most of us do in the future. So you won't necessarily need uh, a complete data science degree to do some data science things like AI will facilitate uh, making it a little bit more accessible to those of us that didn't necessarily get two or three degrees in data science. Next. So I think, yep, that's the uh, end of my introductory comments. Uh, at this point, I'm just really excited to introduce our first uh, presenter. Uh, Jessica Wido, she is the executive director for artificial for the AI for Future Agricultural Resilience Management and Sustainability Center. It's also known as AI Farms. It is a USDA funded national AI institute that's hosted at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She also serves as the associate director for research of their Center for Digital Agriculture at UIUC. She holds a PhD in plant biology from the University of Illinois. And Jessica, we look forward to your uh, comments to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you to the organizers of the Farm Foundation panel for inviting me to speak today on this um, panel. I'm very excited to share the work that we have been doing at AI Farms. So you can go ahead and advance the next slide. Uh, quickly, AI Farms is made up of four universities um, hosted at the University of Illinois, 
Um, Tuskegee University, Michigan State, and the University of Chicago are all partners, as well as we have one national lab, Argonne National Lab, and a non-for-profit non lab of Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis. And then we have a few members who are from USDA, ARS, um, local to University of Illinois at Urbana. Um, just the funding cycle for AI Farms, we are funded by USDA NIFA. Um, we were originally funded in 2020 and will go through the end of 2025. AI Farms has about 29 sub-projects spread across six thrusts, um, and this includes greater than 40 faculty members from a diverse set of um, uh, colleges, including computer science, engineering, crop and animal sciences. And then we support a large number of graduate students and postdocs on the award, on the award and through the Center for Digital Agriculture at the University of Illinois. Uh, finally, we are made up of a, we have an external advisory board that includes members from Deere and Microsoft. So it's a joy to be with them on this panel today. And then other industry members and um, academics, including um, other thought leaders throughout the US. Next slide. Before I go into the mission of AI Farms, I'd like to mention that there are four other USDA funded AI institutes spread across the country. So here I have just listed the host institutes. Um, in 2020, the, there was another AI institute funded with us, APHIS at the University of Davis. Um, the following year, AgAid was funded. The year after that, IRA at Iowa State. And then finally, AI Climate was funded last year. Um, bringing the total number to five institutes. So if you, throughout my presentation, have heard some interesting AI science um, integrated with agriculture, but you don't think that what AI Farms does applies to your particular crop or um, livestock process, then reach out and there very well could be a partner at any of the other institutes that I will be happy to put you in touch with. Go ahead, next slide. AI Farms was developed with the mission that we believe founda foundational advances in AI are essential for inspiring use inspired change and for the future of agriculture in an environmentally friendly, sustainable, affordable way for diverse farming communities. Next slide. Um, AI Farms has what likes to take this a mission and a two-pronged approach. So the first of which is using low-cost semi-autonomous systems. And we believe these are essential for augmenting human efforts to increase yields with lower environmental impacts, improve soil quality, and improved animal welfare. Um, we believe these will be used alongside um, larger traditional equipment and really meant to um, add to the power of human efforts. And then the secondly, we believe in no novel machine learning techniques that are essential for analyzing sparse and heterogeneous data from widely spatial temporal scales um, to augment agricultural practices and help both small and large producers across agricultural systems. Next slide. AI Farms is made up of four research thrusts and two cross-cutting thrusts. The first research thrust is the autonomous farming. And here they're focusing on low cost systems for ag production, including high throughput phenotyping. Uh, the second thrust is the labor optimization for livestock. And this is thought that with the help of computer vision to supplement labor needs in areas of livestock to improve animal welfare and management. The third thrust is environmental resilience. And here we're using machine learning and computer vision methods to improve crop resilience to future climate challenges. The fourth research thrust is soil monitoring and health um, to improve the quality and conditions of our soils. And then we have our two cross-threading um, thrusts, the first of which is technology adoption and public policy. And they work with the research thrust to understand the technologies being developed and how those will be adopted by the farmers um, and in a public policy um, scenario. And then finally, the education and outreach is integrated throughout all of what AI farms does and we believe in the power of raising the next generation of um, farmers. Next. AI Farms is growing um, foundational AI challenges through use-inspired ag. 
Um, we believe that this is empowering and improving ag outcomes, which I'll um, explain throughout my presentation. And we are expanding opportunities through this. On the right here, we're showing the core of AI farms. So our seven foundational AI research goals can be seen in the, the roots of this um, plant diagram and the areas we focus on. We use the challenges and outcomes from that foundational AI research in this use inspired AI challenges that can be seen at, at the soil of the plant. So things like autonomous navigation and edge computing for crop harvesting. And then these can be applied for to the end ag outcomes such as disease prediction or versatile ag robots. Next slide. So AI Farms is taking a multi-pronged approach to developing foundational AI tools. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just talk about two of these data sets, but we have invested a lot of time in using novel agricultural data sets with the idea that these are essential for addressing challenges in AI. So about a year ago, we published the pig life data set, and this is um, made up of a large database of mainly um, uh, image-based um, images for of pigs in our research farms here at the University of Illinois, but there is some raw video data there as well. And using different machine learning, computer vision um, software, this uh, data set has been essential for tracking activity and behavior in various ways of livestock. The second um, data set I'll talk about here is this open world machine learning for phenotype prediction. So this is using machine learning and transfer learning for um, biological traits across species. So an, an example of this is we are using um, machine learning and transfer learning methods to improve the predictability of hyperspec between species of C4 grasses, so between sorghum and corn. Next slide. Um, so on the right of the hand side of the slide, you'll see the uh, image of, from the pig life data set. So this is a video um, of the pigs in their pens. This was trained with a powerful zero shot segmentation algorithm that was importantly not trained on any pig data set. So in its original data set, there was no pig annotation. Um, it was able to identify and track the individual pigs without having been recent or previously trained on pigs. And it does this to a high accuracy, much higher than um, a human could. This, uh, this environment is quite challenging. You can see there's high levels of occlusion, there's m pigs moving everywhere. Um, it, and it's important that for the research to be able to do this to augment um, the behavioral analysis having on farms. Go ahead, next slide. Um, a few other additional ag outcomes that I'll just discuss in brief are our greater adoption of robotics for cover crops, which I'll actually talk about in a few slides. Um, labor efficiency management for livestock, which I mentioned previously. The new methods for scaling soil carbon um, estimations and predictions. So this is shown on the right hand of the slide that across um, fields in the U.S. or in Illinois, you can see at the field view there's cover crops on this on these two fields, um, and then in the aerial and satellite image, really tracking the soil carbon predictions from those fields at an aerial level. Um, then there we've been focusing on new analysis methods for soil microbiome, and then finally, a uh, field level carbon estimation of machine learning processes for soil monitoring and health. Next slide. So a large focus of AI Farms work has been in partnership with Earth's, EarthSense, which is a startup company, um, and they use these under canopy robots to plant cover crops autonomously um, between fields rows of corn before you can get in with traditional drilling or aerial methods. And they get quite an improved stand count from this. This allows the cover crops to take effect sooner and grow longer um, to improve the health of those soils. Next slide. Uh, quickly, just a team of ag robots. So you can see on the top left here, the video showing are on our Canon P robots. And this one is a phenotyping robot. Um, but we also have some 
uh, educational robots, which are kind of the ones in the center of the slide. And then on the right hand, we have soft arm uh, manipulation robots. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, the technology adoption um, thrust has been focusing on cover crop adoption and what drives this throughout the U.S. So they've done a study and shown in this figure is Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa, and what drives the adoption of these cover crops over time. So they found that land ownership, um, if the farmer rents versus owns, it has a, a incentive, to, um, a, a difference for cover crop adoption. Um, whether their neighbors adopt cover crops or not, the actual farm size. So larger farm tends to be more willing to adopt cover crops because they can absorb some of those negative yield um, impacts from the adoption. And then finally, the quality of the soil um, is a key driver in cover cropping. And you will see it since 2011, the number of fields adopting cover crop has increased in the Midwest. Next slide. So finally, looking forward to the future of agriculture, we believe in the power of generative AI. Um, Dennis did a nice job of presenting the power here, so I'll just quickly glance over the slide, but to say that generative AI has the potential to augment technical advisory services um, and improve the outcomes of agriculture. Next slide. So this is being led by the director of AI Farms, Vikram Adve. He is leading this project um, and it's they've titled it Crop Wizard quite um, humorously. And the idea is that it can the, um, the software can take image or text analysis um, and the, a producer can go in and ask specific questions and get a com conversational interaction back. Um, this uh, chatbot was trained on over 10,000 extension documents. Um, and we'll give citations to where the answer is coming from. So you can see in this example, someone has inputted what happened to my corn plant, and it's showing a, a leaf image of um, northern corn blight. And uh, you'll see in the answer on the, the right-hand side here, the, um, question, the person inputting the question could then follow up and ask a follow-up question of how do I um, manage this in my fields? And the um, chatbot will then query back an answer and again, citing all of these. Next slide. We believe this will be essential in, um, in not, re not um, replacing extension agents, but um, helping them get to answers faster and reaching a broader um, diverse community of farmers and, pro and productions um, with these uh, chatbots that are augmenting what an extension agent can do. Next slide. And then this is just another example of it can also use, um, see a, a picture of an insect and you can ask what is this insect and how do I manage this in my fields? Next slide. Um, and then again, this is just the, the tip of what we're doing here um, specifically for this project, but all of it to cross AI farms. Um, and we believe in the power of AI to improve agriculture. And we hope that our research is making a dent with that. And our partnerships with Deer and Microsoft and other industries have been essential in this. And then my final slide, we'll just touch on our educational activities that we believe are essential to the future of agriculture. So the first, we have launched a master's in, of engineering in digital ag and, and corresponding certificate programs. We have a successful NSF REU site that brings in um, minority serving institutions, students, but um, it's open to all students uh, for research experiences in machine learning and agriculture. We have a iFoundry summer school that teaches AI techniques for ag in both, in both crop and livestock app applications. And then finally, we have a K-12 program in digital ag in a box, which is teaching um, K-12 students the power of agriculture in AI. Thanks, Jessica, for just a good overview of the center and the institute over there. Just some exciting work. Uh, really good to see, in some instances, humans still in the loop because like yes. we're, we're at entry stages. 
yet at other in other points full autonomy uh, so kind mm-hmm. of the range um i was impressed with that pig life uh effort with the ability to do things without labeled data that seems to yes. often be a, a, a hiccup in ag and ai is getting labeled data uh, but with that pig life ai what sort of other contextual metadata or backstory about how the pigs are growing what they're eating could we use to help leverage the video analytics even further yep so we have thought about how to keep the video analytics um, labeled in a way that they can be used for future uses that we are not aware of so when a researcher goes through and takes a, a segment of that video the labeling is careful to make sure that it shows the location the time um, the camera that was used, the resolution, um, it's all within that tag. So the metadata is there. And I should say that that data set is really available on the AI Farms data portal. And you can find that through our website. Great. Uh, well, I encourage all of you participating in the webinar today to pose some questions in the Q&A and I will try to dole them out at, the, at just the right time. Thank you, Jessica. We'll bring you back one with the large Q&A a little bit later. Next, I'd like to introduce Jorge Hayrod. Uh, he's the Vice President of Aut- Automation and Autonomy for John Deere. In 2011, Jorge co-founded and became the CEO of Blue River Technology. It's a company that specializes in computer vision, machine learning, and robotics for farming. Uh, that company was acquired by John Deere in 2017. Prior to Blue River, Jorge worked as the business unit director for precision agriculture and the director of engineering at Trimble Navigation. Jorge, thanks for joining us today. We're kind of anxious to see what's the latest in uh, in machine technologies. Yeah, hey, Dennis, thank you very much for, for having me and uh, thank you very much for to Farm Foundation. Um, yeah, what I wanted to talk is how we're using computer vision, machine learning in products, products that we're shipping shipping today. And uh, some of these products uh, might sound a little bit futuristic, but um, I want to you to never forget that these are products that are actually shipping and creating value today and that customers are using it. These are not theoretical things. These are things that are actually happening, which is quite amazing, I can tell. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the, the context is we need to produce more food for a growing population. We we all all know that that's a that's a big challenge, and we need to do it in a in a sustainable way. With a, many cases, with less labor, um, there's a strong strong migration to the cities. Uh, in many cases, with more uh, more um, unpredictable environment, uh, right? More, more unpredictable weather. So we need to adapt to that. Uh, in many cases, we need to do it being very careful uh, about, about productivity. Um, farmer profitability is incredibly important and, and being able to produce more with less is, uh, is incredibly important. So our answer is in the next slide, we call it 35 tons, uh, 35 tons of technology. And, uh, and if you go to the next slide, I want to give you an example of what happens in just one of our machines. This is a a John Deere planter, 24 rows. Um, just to give you an example of how much technology goes into it, um, there are in this picture 250 or over 250 controllers, uh, 20 million lines of code. Uh, we have, of course, cellular connectivity, 59 CAN buses connecting everything, uh, GPS uh, control systems. Uh, PID loops, uh, one, uh, we have gigabit ethernet, uh, and we have over 300 sensors. All of these are looking at what is happening in the machine, uh, and enabling the farmer to control things um, with a little supervision from, from the cab and uh, maintain high productivity as you go through, through the field that uh, speeds up up to 10 miles per hour planting, uh, planting in uh, in that corner soybean field. So lots of technology happening in a, in that tractor. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, pace of advancing, uh, of advancement that is happening in tractors is, is quite high. And this is, I'll call it, uh, the technology 
pre-AI, right? This is all what things that we had pre-AI. But over the last few years, we've started adding artificial intelligence to try to figure out how we can do things better so that the farmer can concentrate on uh, on other other things and uh, get more productivity, more more profitability, more sustainability in their in their operations. And one of the areas where we've made a lot of progress is a product called CN Spray. And this is a product that I worked on in quite a bit. Uh, it was a product that uh, Blue River was working on and John Deere acquired Blue River uh, mostly for this, this product, but also for other things that, uh, that came after in, in AI. But this, this product is a product that we've been working on, I'll say for the last 10 years. And now it's uh, it's finally shipping. So let's go to the next slide where there's going to be a video um, of this machine working through a field. Uh, the the this is a slow speed uh, video. You can you can see it uh, going through the through the the field. It goes at 15 miles per hour. So this would be typical spraying spraying speeds. And you can see the nozzles if you look carefully are turning on and off only when there's only when there's weed. So instead of turning on uh, and spraying all the time, they only spray where the weeds are present. The reason we know uh, where weeds, weeds are present, if you go to the next slide, is because we use cameras. So top, top front, you can see the cameras. They're mounted on those little, uh, little A-frames uh, on top of the boom. They're mounted about every three feet uh, in a hundred and 20 foot boom, we mount 36 cameras and uh, each camera is connected uh, to, uh, to a, processing, uh, a processing unit. We call it uh, a VPU. So we connect four cameras to each VPU. So we have a total of uh, nine uh, VPUs. Those are the, the pieces of electronic that you see on the right circle and they're mounted inside the boom. Uh, and we, we have, a tremendous amount of what is called edge compute that is able to process the images that come from, from the camera and use machine learning, artificial intelligence to figure out where the weeds are, what, what plants are weeds, what plants are crops, and then command um, through, uh, through CAN bus very, very quickly command uh, the nozzles that turn on and, <clears throat> and spray the weeds only where the weeds are. Uh, the the way that this happens is it's uh, the machine again drives at 15 miles per hour and it happens in what we call real time. So as you're driving, the camera that is looking a little bit ahead is looking at the the weeds that are three four feet ahead of the boom, and then processes all these images <clears throat> and recognizes where the weeds are and then commands the um, the cameras and before the the sprayer boom passes over the um, the weed the 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 sprayer is turned on and the liquid flies down to the um, to the to the weed the herbicide flies down to the weed and uh, and and kills kills the weed so lots of technology here uh, computer vision machine learning uh, edge computing and uh, of course, our rugged cameras and, and robotics. Let me let me say a little bit about some some of this technology. You've heard a little bit about computer vision and machine learning. These are two techniques that go hand in hand uh, in our application, right? It's um uh, it's like uh, in in, a, in the human case, we don't see with our eyes, uh, or at least not with our eyes only. We see with our eyes and our brain that is the one that really processes uh, what what is happening. So the the uh, ability to to see really comes from this combination of the visual cortex and 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 the eyes, which are the sensors. So computer vision would be would be using the cameras and then and everything that the eye does, right? Uh, the right illumination, capturing the image, and making sure that we don't have a uh, blurriness and hey, we have uh, shadows don't don't bother us. We we have a uh, high dynamic range. Uh, we have very rugged cameras. Uh, then on the second step is the machine learning. Uh, and these are the algorithms that, again, are similar to what would be happening in your brain, right, that interpret what it is that your, this, uh, this, your eyes are seeing. Uh, 
Uh, and this, this algorithms run in, in very fast computers, and that's where edge computing is, uh, comes about. And most, uh, most AI or a lot of the AI that you see and you hear is typically run in big computer clusters that are in the, in, that are in the, somewhere in the cloud, and, uh, and uh, th this is not possible in this machine. So uh, the machine is in, in a field, connectivity might be spotty, uh, so what we need to do is we need to have that compute running in the machine itself. So that's what we call uh, edge computing, where where the the processing is done is done at the machine itself, as opposed to uh, doing it in the cloud. Um, I talked a little bit about about the cameras already, but they're they're very rugged, they're high dynamic range, they're they're very well suited for the environments where we are, and they capture they capture the uh, the right information. And robotics is uh, about putting all this together, right? Uh, sending the signal to the to the nozzles, sending the signals um, uh, to 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 uh, air, uh, to capturing the image the images from the sensors and and making everything everything coordinated and uh, making sure that the machine is acting based on on the signals that it's uh, that it's capturing with its camera. So that's a little bit about CN spray. We have hundreds of, uh, of units uh, in, in the system, pretty pre close to a thousand units this year um, in, in the system that are working in corn, soy, and uh, corn, soy, and, uh, and cotton in, uh, that work like this. And we also have a little bit of a simpler system that doesn't have uh, artificial intelligence, but also works on, on wheat. Uh, eventually, eventually, we're going to make um, make uh, lo lots of more crops uh, be supported, but we started with uh, this most popular most popular crops and we're expanding. If you go to the next slide, it's going to be a video about CN spray. So hopefully we'll be able to, uh, uh, to hear this video. I'll, I'll let it play. When you start out in the spring, you work the soil, and it just smells so fresh. When you till it up, and it's just the greatest smell. When I started farming, there basically was no technology. Every tractor was driven manually. Everything was done manually. You'd be planting. You had to follow a line. If the sun was wrong, you would lose the line. Darkness, you couldn't see your marks. Moisture, you couldn't see your mark. And then you'd get squiggly rows. My name is Doug Nims. I'm a farmer from Blue Earth, Minnesota. I'm a fourth generation farmer, and I raise approximately 2,000 acres of corn and soybeans. I really never thought I would see an autonomous tractor in, in my farming career. For me, it was really exciting. The first time I got to take the autonomous tractor to the field, swipe my phone, watch the tractor start with no one in the cab, start doing tillage, come to the end of the field, turn on the end, do the tillage just as well as I can do myself with no one in the cab pull up the app, I can monitor the tractor, see how much of the field it's gotten tilled, I can check the fuel level, I can check the app to see how much of the field is left. If there was something in the field that it wasn't sure about, the tractor will stop and alert me. Is this something I can go around? Do I need to go out and remove an object from the field? The app gives me all this information so I can monitor everything very closely. On farms, labor is always a challenge. We need labor for lots and lots of hours for short periods of time. The auto steer and technology has helped reduce our labor load, which makes my life a lot easier. Autonomy will help because we will be able to put a tractor out in the field and let it run for 24 hours a day because it's not manned. But it also helps us with the weather because we can run so hard when soil conditions are fit. The thing that excites me the most about autonomy is not be locked in a tractor cab all day. It will just allow me to run my business better because I can just pay closer attention to other tasks. Now we'll be doing the jobs that we always wanted to get done but never had time to because we were in the cab all the time. 
farmers are fairly traditional. But I have a feeling that once they try it, they will become very accepting of it. I think the tractor can do a better job than I can do. Autonomy. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a life changer for me. Great. So let's go to the uh, next uh, next slide. And the this is the the way that this system works is we have um, we have six pairs of cameras that kind of uh, look in all directions uh, around the tractor. We call it a perception donut. So uh, what what we do is we use GPS to know where we are in the field, make sure that we are in the field and we never leave the the, the field and um, and we follow a path, but the cameras look to make sure that there are no obstacles in our, in our path, right? Something could have uh, blown into the field or somebody could walk into the field. There could be animals. There could be um, things that are in our path. And we need to have a way of recognizing that and stopping when we when we see something. So the, um, the if you go to the next slide, uh, the way that this system works is when it's driving, uh, and you can see it in the in the tractor on the top. The um, the it's, it's driving. It normally just follows follows a path. But then when it sees something, and you can see in the bottom, you can see what uh, in the first image is what the tractor is seeing, right? Uh, then when it sees something, it stops. The way we do this is uh, we use stereo pairs, so that allows us to comp to compute the the depth. And that second image in the bottom is the depth, is what we call the depth image. And uh, you can see the darker color, colors, darker blue are closer to us. Red is, uh, is, is uh, very far away. Green is somewhere in, in, the, in the middle. Um, and what we do is we use the information of what we're seeing from every camera in, 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 in color, but then the power of having two to measure distances to objects. And uh, on the third image is, uh, is the result, we get, we get the uh, RGB and the and the distance, the depth, uh, and we combine them in a machine learning model. And you can see the output of that machine learning model. You can see in um, in yellow is that that um, that uh, 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 object that is being detected there in the in the uh, in the horizon. Um, so that's how the system uh, the system works. Again, the system is, is shipping today. Uh, it's being used by tens of farmers, right? So relative to to see and spray, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit earlier in its uh, in its release cycle, but it's those numbers are going to be growing quite a bit. Uh, these are the images of what the six camera pairs are are seeing when this is when this is happening. Uh, you you can see in the in the front center, you can see the object. Uh, in this case, uh, um, a, 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 a trash bin um, that has been uh, left in the field. Uh, approaches and uh, you can see what the tractor is seeing and processing all the time. If you go to the next slide, um, the the summary that I want to leave you is machine learning is this this thing that sometimes again looks looks and sounds a little bit of futuristic, but what I want to again leave you with a message is that this this is working today. Uh, these are things that are happening in actual in actual farms and customer. Uh, customers are using it and uh, they're taking advantage of computer vision and machine learning. And maybe one last thing I'll say is there was a question I saw in the chat around around connectivity. Yeah, connectivity is very important, but it's not re it's not needed in real time. Uh, so so some farmers don't have connectivity in all their fields. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're addressing that, but the system does not need connectivity to work. Uh, in real time, right? Because it uh, it computes everything in the edge. It doesn't rely on camera uh, on 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 the cloud. It doesn't rely. The image is just processed locally. So connectivity is not required at all instance. Um, connectivity is uh, is, uh, is 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 okay if 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 it's spotty. However, and some uh, it's very important for some cases. Like for example, if you see an obstacle, we um, 
we typically send an image to a farmer. So having some connectivity to send the image to the farmer and say, hey, we found this trash bin in front of a tractor. What do you want us to do? Do you want us to wait for you, go around? Uh, I don't know if it's some, maybe it's a weed or something else. We could say, hey, do you want us to drive through it? And that connectivity is important. And for things like that, um, we, we uh, rely on cellular. Uh, and lately, we have just announced a, a partnership um, with Starlink for satellite communication. So, so our tractors are going to be equipped with uh, satellite communication. And that is, um, that is a great way of, of, uh, of getting, getting uh, communication back to, the, back to the farmer, also sending, of course, all the data that is collected from, uh, from, from the tractor and the sprayer, right? the as applied maps, um, the, uh, uh, the, the yield maps, or any, uh, any other data collected by, by, the, by the vehicle. Uh, can get transmitted to uh, to the operators operation center or back back to the home office. Uh, so connectivity very important, but not not required uh, to be constant uh, all the time because we're using edge computing and edge computing does not rely on 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 connectivity back home. So Dennis, back to you. Or hey, some thanks for some really great. A vision of what's now possible. We're not talking about the future anymore. We're talking about now. Uh, in those autonomy clips, you mentioned, you know, it uses all kinds of computer vision and machine learning. If I bought a John Deere autonomous tractor, is it still learning or has it already done all of its machine learning prior to delivery? And at this point is just executing and reacting to sensor input. So is it still learning or is it done all of its learning? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think the answer is um, a little bit of both. Um, the system is not reliant, as I was saying, on any external communication. It's not learning on the flies it drives. Um, so it's it has been already pre-trained and it already performs, uh, performs like it should uh, when you have it. Uh, however, like all... Um, like a lot of uh, machine learning systems, it's, uh, it's, it's gathering images, right? Because uh, one of the things that, uh, that we do is we encounter new situations. Every farm is a little bit, is a little bit different. So uh, those, those uh, images um, get, get gathered and with farmer's consent get, uh, get sent back to, uh, to John Deere and they can be used for, for, uh, for training and making the system, the system even better. So one of the things that, for example, happens is uh, sometimes we, as I was saying, when we find something, we we stop, and sometimes uh, we stop for things that we shouldn't have stopped, like I don't know, a weed, for example, right? Uh, and, and stopping for a weed is probably not 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 required unless the weed is very big. So so trying to get that fine tuned uh, really well requires us to see a lot of weeds, and hey, this weed is worthy of stopping. This weed is not worthy of stopping for. Um, Right and uh, and trying to train and make the system be better so it's not it's not stopping for when non needed is uh, is uh, is one of the areas that we are going to continue to improve. Same with sand spray, uh, weeds uh, a little bit evolve right with time. Uh, they 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 change and we want to make sure that we capture new images of the weeds. Um, so so we again with farmer permission we we capture those images and when the tractor when the sprayer has connectivity when it gets back to the to the barn where there's Wi-Fi, those images can can be uploaded or the, the field has connectivity, they can be uploaded. But they, the knowledge of that is kind of done uh, what I'll call offline in the off season, right? Where those images, uh, we label them, we train uh, the system and we produce a new model. And for the next season, you have a better model that benefits not only from the images that you send, but the images that all farmers sent that make the system the, the system be better. Great. Well, you know, you have a good presentation when you spark all kinds of Q&A, and there is a pretty good series going, but I think this is a relatively short one. Uh, we could just uh, nip this one here in the bud. Is there latency between the weed detection and the herbicide application, and does the system capture within the row weeds also? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's mm -hmm. right um, uh, in both. So on latency... Yeah, so the latency is provided by the distance between the, where the camera is looking and where the sprayers are spraying. And what we have is, uh, I don't know if you saw it in the, in the video, but the cameras are looking a little bit in front and the sprayers are actually spraying a little bit behind. 
Um, so, so we have that distance that if you trans translate that distance into a time using, a, again, we're going at 15 miles per hour as our top speed, right? That's the time we have, which, uh, which is about 100 milliseconds. And uh, a blink of an eye is about 200 milliseconds. So uh, this is about half of the time it takes a human to blink. That's about the time we have to capture that image, uh, process it all, uh, figure out where the weeds are, and then send the can command and the nozzle to open. And then uh, it turns out that the, the, the major speed, uh, the major time consumption is for those droplets to travel from the, from the nozzle down to the, down to the weed. All that needs to happen in, um, in, uh, in 100, uh, 100 or so milliseconds, which is the time that is provided by, by that distance. So incredibly fast. We've been working on making this fast. So very fast uh, computers, very fast GPUs are needed. And the weeds that we, we spray are both uh, include the ones in the row, right? Provided that they can be seen. If they're completely occluded, right? There's no magic, uh, no magic there. But uh, provided they can be seen, right? Where, where if you're doing it your first or second pass before canopy closure, we we catch we catch uh, all kinds of weeds uh, unless they're comp again completely occluded. Um, and those are the and and um, and uh, anyhow, it, it, I, I would say that our 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 performance is very comparable to what you get with uh, broadcast. We've done lots and lots of trials, and and the the performance, the ability to kill weeds is is very, very comparable to uh, to what we would get for broadcasting because we, uh, another thing I will say is we don't only see weeds from, a chance from seeing from one camera, but because we have 36 cameras, the camera from the side are also hitting it. So we didn't see it, the camera in front, the cameras on the side see it. Uh, that's why we have so many cameras so close together so they can be seeing it. And uh, we can see the, the weed also when, the, when we're 10 feet away, when we're, uh, six feet away when we're three feet away. So we get multiple chances to see it. So it's going to be very hard for a weed to, to hide, even if it's trying to hide underneath a, a, a leaf. Great. Well, thanks. We'll bring you back uh, for a further panel discussion a little later. I'd like to shift to uh, uh, Claudia Russler. She is the Director of Agriculture and Microsoft's Cloud for Industry Engineering team. And she's responsible for strategic partnerships in food and agriculture and for the Microsoft Azure Data Manager for Agriculture. She helps uh, organizations with their digital transformation, enables them to build data-enabled analytics and science solutions for the food, fiber, and fuel value chain. Claudia joined Microsoft in 1992 in Germany. She held several international roles with a focus on business development, sales and marketing, business strategy, and industry. Claudia, thanks for joining. Uh, we're anxious to hear what you have to show us, see what you have to show us. Wonderful. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thanks to the Farm Foundation uh, uh, inviting me to uh, this panel of such accomplished speakers. So uh, being the last one, I, I tried to fill some of the gaps and really want to start by talking a little bit about the commercial opportunity. So if you can go to the next. Uh, uh, Jorge was talking a little bit about this, but really we see there's those forcing factors in the industry that really are driving AI innovation and digital transformation in the industry. One of them is certainly about this ability to make better decisions on farms, more granular, what we just heard, more timely, more preventative action on farms that really allows us to grow more food on the, you know, more um, difficult environmental conditions on fewer acres using fewer input. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the need for transparency. So the consumers are asking for understanding where food comes from and understanding what went into growing food. Uh, but it's not only the consumers, really the uh, regulators and investors are asking for a more trustworthy measurement of sustainability measurements and understanding what really um, is driving scope three emissions coming up from farms. And then Jorge talked broadly uh, very well about the need of automation, but this is really across the industry. We see this uh, issue of labor shortage and aging uh, farmer population that requires supporting robotics and also really think about a broad appliance across sustain uh, specialty crops, livestock, and so on. Next. So when we think about 
digital transformation opportunities in the industry. I think it's important to say we're not expecting the pharma to carry digital transformation on their own. We really see those six key areas that are um, common in the industry. We see a continuous focus on precision farming. So um, enabling outcome-based services in particular from the large input providers, uh, some of the co-ops, the retailers out there in the, marking, in the market. And we see the convergence with precision farming and risk management where insurances and banks take a role in being becoming those data aggregators for farmers and supplying insights to farmers. Uh, we see OEMs stepping up their game like John Deere, but really thinking about product as a service or product and service. So can I combine a digital service with the equipment that I'm selling uh, to farmers? And then we see large brands really stepping up their game when it comes to sustainability commitments and collecting trustworthy data, um, validate data that goes on to their ESG scorecards. And we see the pressure coming from Regulators, uh, like, uh, you know, one example is the UDR, the European Regulation for Non-Deforestation, that's putting a lot of pressure on the traders to be able to prove that produce is not coming from a previously deforested area. So there is, um, you know, we, we think those commercial players are playing a significant role to secure this digital transformation or the ability to do AI in the industry, not only because they partially funding this, but also they play a role to become this data aggregator. And this data aggregation is just a very important factor for data analytics. Next. So I don't know if you've seen this uh, maturity model before, but to easily read that, the more you go to the right-hand side, the more value you're getting out data and analytics and advanced analytics. So most of the solutions today, I want to say, and people on the, in the audience can challenge me, are really stuck in this first piece, which is the connected area. And this basically means I collect data, I provide analytics or data visualization, but I'm not able to take this data and put it in context with other data, which is absolutely essential to get to this predictive stage. So at predictive stage, you see patterns, you're able to pre predict that something is going to happen. And this is when you are able to prevent diseases or pest infestation, because you're able to see it based on the conditions on the farm. To really fully close the digital feedback loop is when you make a prediction, you um, put out a recommendation, and then you actually measure what happened after that. I mean, basically, really what Jorge is said about retraining a model based on what's happening on the farm. So only if you can close this digital feedback loop, um, you'll be able to get to really the full advantage of advanced analytics. There's hundreds of thousands of data points on farms. Most of them sit in silos today. Um, there's no standardization in the industry. Uh, there's lack of interoperability. And there are data privacy concerns from farmers that, um, you know, in reality, reasoning over one farm alone is only so much um, valuable. So, so the need for a data aggregation is clearly here. Next. So this is why uh, Microsoft is really focused on building this agri agriculture data platform, because we want to help with data, uh, the data collection on farms on the first mile, helping with automation of this data collection that helps to reduce errors and inconsistencies in data, how it's collected today. Uh, we want to help with making data interoperable between different systems and suppliers and then sort of allow the data exchange and data integration in the market. We, as you can see on the right hand side, we then give data a place in time and space, which is the foundation for fusing data and enabling geospatial analytics. And, um, you know, this would help then with things like being able to detect crop diseases crop yield predictions, or uh, things like soil health analysis. I want to talk about this on the next slide um, again, because I know we have a pretty, lots of people in the audience are very experienced in that space already, but 
I want to talk about the importance about fusing data. So here in this example, you see we're fusing satellite or drone or camera data with sensors that are in the ground and used both for machine learning. So the, the beauty of that is that through the image data, you have a much better understanding about what's happening in between the sensors where you don't have a sensor reading. So that helps you to give uh, to get to much more granular heat maps. It's going to help you with things like detecting microclimate weather. If you're able to overlay local weather with local weather stations, and it's going to help you with soil sampling in the future as well. Um, next. Uh, we think that in the industry, uh, there's a, such a high number of solutions needed to truly address all the different AI challenges, and you saw many today already. So what we want to work on is building this ecosystem of solutions. What you look at is one initiative that's driven by our a Microsoft research team, it's called Project Farm Vibes, and it's creating those open source uh, configurable workflows that data scientists can use to massage and, you know, use their data with and then build data solutions and analytics on top of it. So you see some of the pre-configured things here are around con um, detecting conservation practices, being able to estimate soil carbon sequestration, and, um, and being able to build sort of on top of those existing models. But we also um, developed a strategic partnership with Bayer. We believe that Bayer, with their experience in um, agronomy and sort of their many years of data science experience, has built many different data models that are super relevant for the industry. And they work with, on, uh, with us on building this ecosystem of solutions, which we then call the Ag Powered Services. And as Ag Powered Services help companies like an accelerator, if you want to build an AI model, you can use that and then build on top of it and uh, put this all together in end-to-end -to -end solution. We think that's absolutely absolutely needed to drive innovation in the industry. There's a lot of repetition in the industry. Data science is an expensive um, business and being able to not replicate, but build on top of something that's already existing. We think that's just super important for the success of the entire industry. Next. So I just want to jump through a couple of examples that we believe are really um, uh, will create where we can create value with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Many of those have been um, covered already by Jessica, by Dennis, and by Jorge earlier today. This is a, actually a visual that uh, is I pulled together in 2019, and I think I still find that most of those categories hold strong today. Uh, the one thing I may have unexpected is really this opportunity of using contextual advice that truly got like a super boost with everything that's going on around large language models and the notion of building co-pilots, which I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later today. Uh, we don't have time to go through examples for each of those, but I want to just jump really, really quickly into some of those because I want to highlight uh, specific things. So on the next one, this is a greenhouse example. It's actually a very, uh, pretty much old case study or old uh, example here where one of our research team worked uh, with a group of people and the, uh, a challenge the University of Wageningen in Netherlands pulled out. And what's interesting about this one is that the AI teams, there were like those six AI teams competing against uh, growers were really able to outperform uh, growers in, in many of the different categories. And that's mostly because AI is just able to foresee when conditions are changing. And that's true for weather, AI abandoned seedlings that were not performing as well sooner than human would do. So I think it's a great way to think about uh, AI enabling sooner action and being able to address upcoming issues as an opportunity. 
The next example is uh, basically, I mean, you saw, you saw better things today already, but I wanted to pull in a couple of examples where I believe cognitive services are becoming super relevant. So here on the, on the top, you see how an image is uh, analyzed and all the different attributes you can read based on one image here. I think what's important to understand now we look at images today, we already looked at the, the pig um, video that Jessica had in terms of seeing patterns and movement and everything. But what's important to understand, it's everything we see, it's everything we hear, it's actually everything we smell. So technically we can analyze video data or build alerts based on what's happening uh, in a barn uh, in, or on, on a farm by just sort of really putting alerts based on stress levels, for example, and looking for specific criteria. I think this is also going to be uh, super fueling everything around um, training models, training new models. So in the case of what Jorge talked about, um, precision spraying, uh, a lot of this depends on having image data to train models. So we can use the same technique to actually create images that then can be used to training models. So that's going to help to train models on the edge cases, like how does a grape look like in the case of a wildfire as an extreme example. Quickly, I wanna to touch on the handwritten notes down there. I think that's uh, near and dear to many people in the industry being able to really get data that's that's really hard to use today and then being able to decipher it and not only that but also being able to translate it and make it available for analytics i think that's going to play a significant role in everything that's around traceability and keeping records that are just today mostly been held on uh, <clears throat> apologize on paper next so I just really want to um, like quickly show you the different use cases. It's uh, very, it's a much older video, but very similar to what you see, saw before. I think the interesting thing about uh, image analysis is really think about what can be done for the environment, what can be done about the movement, what can be done around the health, but then also what can be done and seen directly to a livestock or we even see monitors that are inside of livestock. So how can this data be used? The, the interesting thing you see, uh, I intentionally put those things in that are more not livestock, but sort of wildlife migration and being able to t detect and identify animals based on patterns. That's really something that is going to be very interesting for the future. Um, I really, really quickly want to go to the next and um, sort of talk about the big opportunity that we see in generative AI. Uh, you see on the right hand side, a couple of those example questions we believe we can enable uh, farmers with, but really the uh, level of innovation that came in the last couple of, uh, well, I should say maybe a year, uh, through ChatGPT and through the innovation following on has been more than I've seen in my entire career. Like uh, I think ChatGPT got 100 million users in two and a half months. I think many would wish to see that happening to their product, but it's really a new way to interact with analysis and analytics and information. It's much more inclusive. It's much more intuitive. It enables new ways to collect data, but also to provide advice and then provide contextual and dialogue um, advice to growers in the future. Uh, we think it's a new way of working. It's really not limited to uh, pharma facing opportunities. It's, it's basically everything you work um, you work on can start off a draft is analyzed before you even get started working on something. So here you see an ex um, an example of a project we've done with Bayer where they pull um, uh, historical records from a field that then sort of give insight about what's been applied. You can ask questions about what's the difference between what's planted, what's harvested. So there's many different use cases that can be feed 
by data such as, you know, data you can get through satellite or through weather and then through machine data in particular as well. So this, there's many different use cases we're seeing from anything that, uh, you know, providing pharmacy advice. We saw this example on diseases or we see pricing um, use cases where they can understand what's the best time to sell and what's the best marketplace to sell. Uh, we see insurances using that to organize their field people. Um, there's like there's such a breadth of opportunities in their market. And even I just on Jorge's point about on the edge analysis, one of the early use cases we've done with a farmer we work really closely with is putting John Deere Manuel on a local large language model in the cap so that uh, he at any time can ask questions if anything is not working or in which never happens, but um, um, obviously has any questions about uh, the tractor or the functions in, in the cap. So there's a, there's this wide variety. And I want to, I want to finish coincidentally similar to where Dennis started and next. And this is really, I, I did basically similar to Dennis. I thought if I talk about generative AI and never starting from scratch, I should have asked generative AI what I'm talking about. So I went into uh, something um, that's called whiteboard and whiteboard can brainstorm with you about ideas. So uh, similar to Dennis, you can see some of the ideas um, in this case, the co-pilot came up with to suggest what I'm uh, talking about. This is powerful technology. I've seen this from um, imagining new products to um, uh, looking for market validity, writing financial plans to writing a marketing strategy. So I think it's really truly going to um, make the whole industry to think differently. And, and we see fantastic new opportunities coming with this technology uh, in the near future. So then is, uh, with this, uh, back to you. Great. Um... I'm not going to hide my enthusiasm for your slide where you mentioned setting the stage for generative ag, AI and ag, because I think it's tremendously useful. But if, it seems to, to me that some of the questions that are posed require records. Well, records, we used to call them records, now we call it data. But some of those questions will require data that farms don't keep digitally. So to bring a little bit of humor into this webinar, I'm reminded of a meme that I saw on LinkedIn a few years ago, and I saved it. And the words were, why is it we can crash a spaceship into an asteroid 7 million miles away and successfully change its orbit, but we still have trouble getting a grower to record what was planted on a field? <laughs> uh, who has a solution for this? Uh, and... Maybe this is for the broader discussion, but uh, if Microsoft has a solution, it would be great to hear. Yeah, I, I want to say two things. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this, and I love it. Like I love the quote. So, <laughs> but there's two things to it, right? One is there's a lot of things that really can be automated and collected today that don't require someone to fill out service. I mean, there's also farmers really stressed out by filling out 400, 500 question long surveys they get on a day-to-day -day base. But, but you know, being able to use data that can be collected through satellite, being able to use data that's coming off equipment, such rich data, uh, Jorge will be able to uh, agree, I hope, is, is uh, you know, what's been planted, what's been spread, what's been harvested, data that can be made available for analytics and sort of uh, other and more environmental related data. So that's one piece. So really start from where data is collected easily. And then I want to just go back to something Jessica said is it doesn't have to be necessarily exactly what's happening on a farm. One of the first um, co-pilots we've seen was really made on top of policy documents then and making them available to farmers, helping them fill out applications for subsidies. I mean, there's so many possibilities to really start thinking through and making lives easier based off, uh, on uh, existing you know, data that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to all be back for a little bit of Q&A. 
I saw some <clears throat> uh, questions in the chat. We did try to get those all over to Q&A, and the purpose for that is so that we don't lose track of them. Uh, so I just certainly encourage all participants to just contribute to the Q&A. There are a few there that I think are, are pretty specifically just Jorge because they relate to very specifically uh, your automation things. Um, I think I'm going to start with this one. In the UIUC, well, actually, let me hold it up to make sure that Jessica is here. I'll start with this one. I know we don't want to get too technical in, in this, but I think the diverse audience that we have today and those that may watch it as a recording later should be aware that there are many different artificial intelligence tools and techniques, methods. They've got, and I'm not listing them all, but just a few of them, support vector machines, artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks, k-nearest neighbor algorithms, long short-term memory, random forests, large language models, and more. Uh, could we maybe go back to, and each of you can sort of take the mic and just run with it for a minute or two, some of the applications that you showed, and then pair up what AI method was used to execute that particular uh, solution, I guess you'd say. So was it a neural net? Was it k-nearest neighbor? Was it long short-term memory or or that sort of a thing? So you can all jump in as you wish. Yeah, hey, I can I can start. Um, so we, we use deep neural nets. Uh, they call them DNNs or CNNs. Um, so uh, we for sure started with uh, some of the uh, other methods. We we tried SVMs, uh, support vector machines. Uh, we've used K-nearest K neighbors. Uh, we used random forest. Uh, but but uh, I think that the deep neural net nets uh, have taken over um, the world in uh, in the world of AI. I guess um, there is uh, there is uh, a, a lot of. Um, a lot of good that has come from, especially for image processing, from uh, from from um, from deep neural nets. The technique we use is um, is uh, it, it, we we use pixel wide segmentation. Uh, so we train our system. It used to be that uh, when when uh, when CNNs when the convolutional neural networks started, uh, a lot of it was what is called bounding box training. Um, um, uh, so, so we've tried, we, we used, we, we, we've tried and used it, uh, and some of our prototypes used, uh, single, single shot box detectors, but, but, um, now we're using, uh, the, the, in the industry, they call it semantic segmentation. So that means that every pixel, you know what it is. Uh, and I good, anyhow, you saw it in some of my, my presentations, uh, in my, some of my videos, but also that that pig video was very memorable, Jessica. So so that's what they use there, right? Uh, so you can see that it's not only a box that is around the pig, but uh, it's it's the each pig is being colored of a different color, a different color. Each pixel of the pig of the that uh, is being seen. Uh, so anyhow, we, that's exactly what we use. We use uh, we use uh, semantic segment segmentation that allows us to. To do that, to 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 distinguish different instances of uh, what we're seeing, and every pixel gets mapped to it, so so we know exactly what it is. Anyhow, and I can go into more more details on why that's better, but I would say that that's kind of state of the art on uh, on uh, on computer vision with machine learning is semantic segmentation together with convolutional neural nets. Dennis, you might be. Does anybody, does anybody want to comment on which AI methods work on things other than image processing? It's a tough question. I know. Who was this for, Dennis? Well, which uh, AI method was used for particular solutions that have been developed? For example, the large language model is the tool when you're trying to consume lots of trusted documents, get a, a posed question in a chat bot and respond. Okay, so that would be a large language model. Um, so I don't know, I was just curious about which tools we're using uh, and neural nets certainly taking off. I'm seeing in myself increased applications of this 
thing called is very confusing at first, but long short term memory that seems yeah. to be also catching on. Yeah, yeah. And another one that is getting very popular is something called transformers, which is uh, what all this uh, LLAs, uh, large text language models, LLMs, um, LLAs or LLMs or mm -hmm. um, um, generative AI uses. It's uh, it's a it's the one of the big advantages we can handle different sorts of data, right? It's really good at uh, at uh, not only predicting something from us in a single shot from an image, but it's also really good at at knowing a little bit of the sequence, and that's how it understands language because it, language is not just what you hear now or the last word you read right it's it's all the sequence all the words that came before um all the words that are around it that makes makes uh, you understand what it is that you're reading so so transformers are really good for for understanding sequence of things where there's where one thing is related to the others um so that's why it's becoming very popular in the case of uh, of uh, weeds uh, we 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 basically look every single image that the camera captures we try to figure out what it is that we're seeing. So what what we saw in the prior ones is, doesn't doesn't really help us much. It's um it's more what you're seeing in every single image. So so convolutional networks is is the tool to use. Joy Wilson posed uh, <clears throat> a very good question, and I chatted back to her that it's a complex one. We better talk about it. We can't just put it in writing. Her question was, what is being done? to help farmers investing in AI, are they able to recoup the cost? Uh, so I suppose we each have a, a perspective. I'm trying to moderate, not provide answers. So I'll first, uh, if you could each give sort of a, at least a, a short answer, how do we recoup the cost? How do we make it cost effective uh, for this advanced technology on farms? If each of you could address that, that would be great. Yeah, I can I can jump on this, uh, Dennis, if you like. But um, I think I was trying to get a little bit this, to this on uh, my my initial part of the presentation. One, I really think it is difficult to take full advantage of AI if you reason over one farm. There is no comparison, right? You compare about your farm and only what you've done in the previous year. So um, that's just a that's just a fact. That's to accept. Then there's many farms that are just not in a, either financial situation or are large enough to really run meaningful things on their own or analytics just for their own farm. We we actually work with one farm who's very sophisticated. Uh, he was a previous Microsoft employee as well. He has a PhD. So, so that's a sophisticated farmer. He is taking advantage. But I believe it's really important to work with those aggregators. So there's the, the years providing intelligent equipment. There's companies, uh, if it's info providers or your co-op, or is a, it, it's an insurance and bank that's providing the level of data aggregation needed that is needed for um, running analytics on top of it. So you can secure data privacy because that's important on one hand, but then you take advantage of having more data you can reason over it. And I think that's the future and we'll see many more different uh, business models coming out there, um, but, but that's going to drive digital transformation and uh, allow farmers to participate um, in it as well. Yeah. I can jump on. Yeah, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Jessica. Um, just to say that within our research institutes, we're focusing on low cost solutions. So some of these um, solutions are really aimed at specialty crops or smallholder farmers that can implement them with a low barrier to entry. So something like we have a project that's working on specialty weeding and, spe and weeding and specialty crops. Um, for somebody that has a couple acre operation that it will be low input or maybe they can go in on a service that is rent based to where they can rent the service for the day um, and it weeds their field for them or something like the cover crop planting that could be done on a renting application. Um, additionally, things like the large language model that is really meant to augment extensions. So for smaller 
um, farmers who maybe not would not have access to a crop advisor who could be very costly, they could use these large language models to get um, expert advice on their problems they're seeing in their fields. Yeah. Hey, um, agree agree with everything that has been said. Uh, I think relying first it starts by with uh, knowing what it is that you want to do, right? Because if you can take AI in so many so many directions, uh, I think the way, best way to do that is uh, as uh, Claudio was saying is rely on people you trust, uh, right? Start starting with the dealers, your crop advisor, uh, your retailers, um, uh, your 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 extension uh, university extension programs. Those are all great sources to help you figure out what it is that is useful, what is useful for you, what they have tried, what they have seen working. Um, so anyhow, that's the place where to start. And then uh, on how to get this, uh, I think one of the interesting things is uh, business model innovation. As, uh, as Jessica was saying, uh, I think that there's a lot of uh, things happening in that area, right? One of the, if you cannot cannot afford the the the... I don't know, a car, but you need to still drive from here to there. You can take an Uber, right? You don't need to own the car, uh, right? So this rental model, pay as you go, um, is, is a good one. And we've been experimenting with that. And uh, CN Spray, actually, we we just launched this year, um, a, uh, or, or sorry, in 23, uh, new for, for this year, for 24, a uh, something called CN Spray Premium. So it's a, it's a cost-effective uh, unit. It's a, anyhow, develop, a, develop this machine learning algorithms and all this, uh, cameras and all that. It costs a lot of money, but what we're doing is we are um, selling it for, for a relatively low low price. It's a couple thousand dollars, a couple a couple tens of thousands of dollars, um, uh, around $20,000. And you can get this uh, CN Spray Premium e equipment and then you pay as you use it. And only if you use it. So you try it, if it works, great. You, you use it and you pay, you pay a fee per acre. Yeah, if uh, if it doesn't work for you, you can just uh, stop stop using it. So it's a way of de-risking it and not not having to pay for the full cost if you're not if you're not fully sure. Uh, of course, the hope of uh, John Deere is that you use it, you love it, you see so much value that you'll use it a lot. But um, but anyhow, if it doesn't work for you, uh, you have a, an easy way out. If it's not if it's not all what you what you thought uh, it would be, you have an a, an easy an easy out if it doesn't work. Uh, but this, I think what we're going to be seeing is in this advanced technologies, a lot more of this um, change of models where you're not, where you're, you're paying as you use it. Uh, I think it's a pay, 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 pay as you use it. It's a, it's a model that works. And if there's value, you continue to use it. Right? That's uh, the, the whole hope of a model like that. I'll chime in just a little bit on the whole cost effectiveness and adoption. Of course, uh, things like the AI Institutes, and Jessica showed us where they are across the country, NSF uh, Engineering Research Centers, USDA grants, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus in this realm. So that is the sort of the government's way of uh, getting this moving and in motion and developing some of the core uh, principles and, and that sort of thing. But then at some point, it does have to come down to, it has to be cost effective, uh, where companies like John Deere and Microsoft and all the others develop a product that actually doesn't cost, but it pays. Like you can't afford not to do it because it is the right thing to do. So I think I'll, that's why I think it's a complex answer. And I wanted to have, have the chance of all of us to talk about it because it, it has many aspects to the funding of the development and the eventual rollout as commercial products. Yeah, Claudia, do you have something to add? Yeah, I just want to add something to what you just said. Mm -hmm. and I think one of the issues and why things are as expensive as they are is because we have this duplication in the market. Like every single company is trying to develop the same and, you know, removing like clouds and shadows from satellite image data is really not differentiated as just one random example. So I think we need to get into the stage, you know, where we use what's existing out there. And I mean, I love everything Jessica shared today about the work, um, you know, they're doing and can you build on top of this? Can you innovate on top of it? So that this funding is not an issue, right? There's lots of money spent today on, um, 
trying to run programs that are not sustainable. And we want to get to a stage where you lower the cost and then you can run a program sustainable where every uh, farmer can participate. That's a great transition to Allison's question. Uh, she mentions that she's working for the AI Climate Institute, which I think is led by Minnesota as partners of other institutions as well. And her question is essentially to the three of you, how is your company or how does your institute engage with stakeholders? And could we all partner together to reduce that? We're doing the same thing as the other people are doing. We just didn't share it. And I understand the barriers in the corporate setting because there is intellectual property here and it ought to be protected. It's a profitable thing. But uh, if you could just address how do you engage stakeholders and are there ways that we could reduce the duplication? I think those are very good points. Now, I'm, I'm happy to go first on this one. Um, so yes, I think that's engaging the different stakeholders. This is core for what we're trying to accomplish. We wanna build this ecosystem of solutions out there in the market. And for that, we really work with uh, companies. So both commercial organizations, academic, uh, academic uh, institutions, government entities, and really try to bring the different stakeholder together. Uh, I think we can simplify uh, the data foundation, we can help with the interoperability between different parties and also provide, Dennis, to your point, um, um, uh, space for confidential compute. So you can actually share without, um, you know, being afraid to sharing your IP at the same time. I, I, I think it's a mind change and companies and organizations need to switch sort of their Obviously, we talk to a lot of companies that come out of research that are grown in research and IP protection is the most common thing. Those are companies that probably haven't let their people go outside of the organization with their laptop only 10 years ago. So this notion of being able to work together, collaborate and innovate together is something that is something we need to learn. Uh, we have a research team that engages with this uh, open source um, models and work they're doing, the workbooks they're providing. And then we really try to do the same on the commercial side, working with uh, key organizations in the industry. Jessica, I know, I know the center and the institute is engaging stakeholders when we can describe a little bit of that. Yep. So I'll start with our academic stakeholders. We are integrally involved with the other AI institutes, including AI Climate. Um, and we talk regularly. We share knowledge. Um, we are planning a joint white paper about the importance of investing in AI for agriculture. Um, we really leverage on each other's institutes. Like I said at the beginning of my presentation, um, we often direct knowledge to from one institute to the other by connecting people. On the industry side, we ha all have advisory boards um, that we work with throughout the year to uh, learn from and try to reduce duplication. So if they said, oh, some we've talked to representatives from Deere and we were working on something and they said, oh, we've worked on this, this hasn't worked. We said, okay. Um, and we were able to learn from that and pivot. So it's just an interactive um, conversation. And like Claudia said, open data sh sharing is critical. Um, it is going to be a mind shift to be able to leverage some of these large data sets across institutes and learn from them in an open way. Ray, do you want to speak to how deer engages farmers in focus groups and things like that? Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. We 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 do our uh, our the best we can to to uh, understand the customer. Uh, our customer needs and what is useful. A lot of the uh, people that work at John Deere are farmers themselves, and we have lots of focus groups and uh, dealers and uh, ways in which we collect the input on what uh, what is useful. I think that the industry in general, I would comment that in uh, AI is 
is um is a little bit different um than um the, and better in, in in when it comes to IP. A lot of the tools um that we're utilizing are just so specialized, right? Convolutional neural nets are just so complicated and complex. And a lot of the tools to do that are free. Um, you can, uh, you can. Um, I don't know if you, if you, if you are a, a computer scientist, are familiar with computers. You can, you can be utilizing. Uh, um, you can you be utilizing um, a lot of uh, a lot of the tools that are uh, that exist for for machine learning and computer vision. If you're so inclined, I don't know how many farmers would would really want to do that versus having to. Uh, Go on farm, but it is it is there, and it's helping the entire industry to have all these tools. Uh, a lot of the 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 uh, ways in algorithms that are being used are being published in in open papers, right? It used to be that a lot of the things would be just go directly to be patented and very mm -hmm. very um, hard to utilize by others. But no, a lot of a uh, a lot of uh, we use something called TensorFlow, which is done by by a. Uh, by Meta, uh, which is uh, they're 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 very good at recognizing faces, and uh, it turns out that to recognize a face, it's uh, very similar to what you need to do to recognize a weed, right? Um, so so we use a lot of algorithms that uh, that they have published, uh, but Google, Microsoft, a lot of people that are doing research on this are publishing this, uh, uh, publishing what they find, and uh, really really thankful for for the open community that is happening around AI. There's a question by Gary, and it overlaps a little bit with the question by Daryl, but I'm going to go with the way that Gary worded it first. Uh, and you three are in, a, I think, a great position to address the question, uh, certainly better than me. Is there any concern that anti-artificial intelligence groups like the Center for AI Policy, the Center for AI Safety, I suppose there are others, uh, any concern that they will deter progress in developing artificial intelligence for ag? It is recorded, so you got to be careful what you say, of course. Yeah, yeah I think in uh, <laughs> in general, uh, the topic of AI comes uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know, movies of uh, like Terminator movies come to mind and... Uh, all uh, anyhow, it, I I I think that there is a um, Hollywood um, has put a little bit of a I don't know a spin on on AI that sometimes we we get and I think that that's gotten some people nervous and uh, I, I don't know it's uh, yeah can I guarantee that uh, that a T five Terminator won't show up in our in our doorsteps <laughs> uh, but yeah the answer is that very likely no but um, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen um, it's uh, there's a lot of, a lot of what we're doing is uh, is really good for for ax uh, prop, solving ax problems and in in in, uh, in 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 labor shortages on increasing sustainability right a lot of the things that you have heard today are the type of products that we need to do in order to move ax ax forward better sustainability better profitability better better productivity do be be able to do more more with less and it's very well aligned with what uh, what farmers want. So far, uh, uh, groups haven't I don't know done done anything to quite uh, stop. I think if anything, the concern is that if uh, if the U.S. doesn't doesn't lead it, um, who else is going to lead it, right? If, if we were to slow ourselves down, it's not like you can that that any group any institution has the ability to stop. It'll probably just happen somewhere else. So that's another. That's another thing to take take into account that uh, that we 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 probably want to be leading. We want to be ahead and taking advantage of this new new technology um, and and all the good things that it has to offer. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what Jorge said about this. I I do want to uh, just be clear that large language models don't require to reason on any data that's out there in the universe as well, right? I mean, we're actually coining a, uh, the term of small language models. Like you're, it's really in your control what you want to run um, those language models on it. It could be a document. It could be all the documents that are available within an organization. It can be very contained in a way. 
for the broader, the other thing I just want to mention really quickly, and because it's really near and dear to our heart, uh, we kicked off this um, work around responsible AI that sort of really sets the standards about how we think about data privacy, inclusiveness, fairness. I mean, there's it's out there, and if someone is interested in responsible AI, um, that are there to avoid that it becomes this horror movie that Jorge was talking about, right? It's like, let's make sure we have conditions how we use large language models. So it doesn't require someone to narrow the scope or influence how it's used in public. So hopefully that's, that's helping to prevent something like this in the future. So Jessica. Yep, I agree with all of what's been said as well. I. Um, I will add that we also believe we call it trustworthy AI, responsible AI um, is the way to go of showing these use cases where AI is doing good for the world and for the challenges of agriculture. Um, so if you think of something like autonomous um, systems like the John Deere tractor or our small robots, those are great ways to test these complex scenarios in a um, more controlled environment of a field rather than uh, on the complex streets of New York rather than, um, you know, it offers some of the same challenges, but in a more controlled way. And we believe that is true throughout agriculture. It ag really um, highlights some rich and complex data sets that they can be used to um, make advances in foundational AI then applied to other aspects and other challenges um, throughout the uh, other um, industries. I'm paraphrasing a statement by uh, Fredman Malik in his book on management is essentially this, that it is the optimist or the, uh, the positive thinker that if there is a solution, they're the ones that are going to find it. Because if you're a pessimist and don't think there's a solution, you're not even looking for it. So on one hand, it's it's groups like us here and the ones the, that we represent who are looking for those those uh, responsible, secure uh, AI solutions that can help solve problems. But on the other hand, it also is probably good as a little check and balance to have these other centers and institutes that raise up the caution flags so that when we do develop things, we're a little bit more uh, robust in our testing. We're a little bit more thorough in security and those sorts of things. So it certainly is a balance. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate your, your responses along that thread. Uh, okay, I lost track of the next question I was going to pose here. Uh, some of them were relatively specific to maybe a slide or two that a couple of you had. Um, uh, if we could bring up, there was one hidden slide in the deck that I thought we could bring back into the discussion. Uh, if we can find that one. Yes, this is it. Uh, and actually, um, I saw in the chat, someone had posed a question about the, the benefits of digital twins and crop modeling. And so I wanted for us to at least address uh, briefly the opportunity for data and models to work together. Da models that are both AI and also models that are simply regression equations or F equal MA is, you know, a classic model. It's an equation that describes how things work in the physical world in which we live. So this was uh, my attempt to <clears throat> identify several types of decisions that could be facilitated. We often make them, they are data driven, but they'd be even more powerful if they were data and model driven. Uh, so if we could go to the next version of this same slide. Uh, as you as we use this visual sort of as a prompt, does this make us think of data we wish we had to drive AI that we don't have yet? I guess that's one very open-ended question. Uh, 
Does this spark any thoughts about where we ought to focus AI in the near term? So I guess just as you're looking at that visual, any response about, boy, we do need better data in this realm or that realm or something like that. Uh, so just very open-ended. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, I want to just say, I think it's the ability not only to have more data, but then really to choose spatial temporal align it so you can run those different analytics on it. So if you really want to get to a digital twin of a farm, it, re it requires you to be able to overlay the environmental information with the, the genomic seed composition of, you know, what's growing there and sort of what the management that went into that. And I think the digital twin is absolutely a great um, way to think about this. It requires to be able to not only get all of this data, but then you, the moment you start meshing up with very detailed um, data in some areas and you can then sort of predict what's happening on farms where there's not such high instrumentation, I think that's where you really get to the value. So being able to expand insight across, uh, you know, farms where you don't have all the insight that's required. Like I think you looking at you, Dennis and and Jessica and others, like we're at a very con comfortable stage where you on research farms you're able to collect a lot of data. You're not getting to the same level on a regular farm. So how can you use the very dense uh, amount of data you get in some areas and then extend it and get insight for others out there. Yeah, I'll just jump on that. I agree if we could get data that's at a higher level, higher quality from larger farms than what somebody like Purdue or the University of Illinois normally has access to, we could use some of these powerful AI tools to um, make advances from that data, but just a lack of data overall. Um, I have no specific answer to what I would like, just everything, give me all your data. Ideally annotated, but as we saw, we can do things without annotations. Yeah, I think great comments. I don't know that I have too much to add, but I, I think that's that's right. Related to this merging of there is public data, there's private data, these models. Uh, Servio Palacios posed a question about what strategies and safeguards should be implemented to mitigate the risks and maintain reliability and integrity. Uh, these are, yeah, these are tough things. Uh, one of you mentioned, and uh, I have personally know Servio, so I think I know where he's coming from. Uh, one of you mentioned sort of the uh, send the code to the model send the code to the data rather than sending the data to the platform. You know, that is one way to increase security. Uh, well, we're closing in on time and I wanted to pose just one final, and we can get rid of that slide. Thank you very much. Um, just as we near the end here, we're early in application of AI in ag. Like it's a baby thing, <laughs> very, very much a baby. Uh, as we well, I'll, I'll put it this way. Within the next 12 months, what do you think might be reasonable deployments of AI broadly applied? Like not every farm has it, no. Uh, and it, probably Jorge has some John Deere examples of well, this is going to be it. But even beyond that, uh, where do you think? AI will be deployed within the next 12 months that will have big impact in agriculture. Here's your crystal ball moment. Yeah, I, I um let me let me uh start. I guess uh we're we're my team is in charge of uh, automation and autonomy within John Deere. We have eight different projects that are where we're working on on AI and machine learning basically using cameras to help machines see and react to what they're seeing. I've talked about two of them, the autonomous tractor and CN spray, but there's six others that are coming down the pipe. One that we've announced is called Furrow Vision. It's a product that works in planters. You can see inside the furrow and we can um, 
we can uh, use and calculate the depth by and look at what is in there. We can make sure that the residue wheels are set correctly, that the, that the down pressure, down force is, is, is correct, and uh, you can make sure that you're doing a good job uh, planting. Uh, we have products on uh, also already shipping in the combines, and we're coming up with a new set of products pretty soon. So stay tuned. Um, there'll be uh, there'll be some 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 announcements on that. Um, but uh, we're we're using cameras to basically see inside the the combine. Normally, you cannot see a farmer is driving, right? So he doesn't he or she doesn't know what is happening inside the. The, the, the combine and the, the combine is about separating the, the wheat from the chaff, right? Uh, the grains from, from, from the, everything that is not grain. So it's, um, it's, it's a very complicated process and the farmer just doesn't see it. Uh, so now with cameras and machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can tune those things automatically and make sure that the, the, the combine is being fed enough material and, um, and uh, in general, do a better job than a human can because because the human doesn't have the ability to see inside the combine uh, as a human is driving. So uh, lots of things mm -hmm. happening. Uh, products to enhance safety, uh, autonomy for other areas. We started with large ag, but uh, autonomy for orchards is another area where we're working. So uh, I I think at all where the all, all these products are going to come to light in the next two or three years. Uh, in particular, the harvesting and the planting are you're going to see it in the next year. Okay, Claudia or Jessica, final thoughts? Well, I, I think I talked a little bit about in the beginning, it's really depending on where you are on the agriculture value chain. Like if you're an insurance and bank and you loan money to growers and they need to go through more challenging environmental conditions, so you want to help them making better decisions on farms, right? If you're a brand and you are facing challenges because you need to be able to report on non-deforestations, you very much will need to be able to do this within a year because the regulation, you know, get like... Um, starts um, to be valid in a year. If you, uh, like, I like Willy Horcher's example um, on automation, how can we bring that to other places like speciality crops? So it's hard to have one common answer for everything. It really depends. And thankfully this innovation is going on in parallel across the industry. And, um, and I think where I wanna see the innovation is really about bringing this data together and making it available for analytics. So if there's one place we need to start is just getting to a solid data foundation in the next year. And Jessica. I get to be the one who's on the research end. So maybe in three to five years, I'll have some really exciting things. But um, in general, I think that I would agree anything involving computer vision from um, mechanical weeding to even, even something like high throughput mm -hmm. phenotyping for improved plant breeding um, is pretty close to adoption. Great. Well, I personally want to thank the three of you, Jorge, Claudia, Jessica, for just being a great panel today. I want to personally thank Martha King, Morgan Craven, the entire Farm Foundation crew for organizing uh, this AI-related webinar. AI is here. Uh, it's going to be revolutionary in agriculture. And the more we can share about it, know about it, inform each other, uh, then the better off we'll be. So with that, um, Martha, back to you. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you to all of our speakers for the insightful discussion today. I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us, submitting your questions, some great engagement throughout the session today. We appreciate that and we would love to hear your feedback. So please take a moment to share your comments about today's session in the very brief survey you will see at the conclusion of this forum. If you would like to help us continue providing valuable programming such as today's forum, I'll quickly remind you about becoming a friend of Farm Foundation. Check the link provided in the chat to learn more. Each and every gift to Farm Foundation strengthens our ability to address rapidly evolving issues impacting agriculture, the food system, and rural communities, and we are so grateful for your support. Thank you once again for joining us today. We will now conclude the forum.